Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Tuesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. We have our second installment of our special year-end awards from the Three Martini Lunch. We began that on Monday. Today is the second of six installments And our three martinis today are Sorry to See You Go, Rising Political Star, and Political Figure Fading into Oblivion. Each of us will have their winners in each of those categories. Jim, you get to go first, and we start with the somber category of Sorry to See You Go. Um, There are obviously a lot of prominent, uh, influential, and important figures who died in the past year, Greg. There was certainly no... No shortage of competition for this title, but it kind of seemed appropriate, considering how you and I got the idea for doing this from watching the McLaughlin Group, uh, to say farewell to John McLaughlin, um, longtime uh, political figure who very early in the 1980s, or maybe in the late 70s, started the McLaughlin Group. It was kind of an attempt to uh, energize and revitalize political discussion on television, and then up becoming extremely influential, not just all the sheer number of uh, big-name political writers and journalists and, and columnists who ended up uh, coming in as panelists. Um, I think it's a, a very, it became a very influential show. And when he, you know, passed away, they decided to kind of retire the concept of the show. Um, when you hear, you know, issue one, you obviously first, first of all, you think of Dana Carvey's impression of him, which <laughs> almost as distinctive and famous as uh, John McLaughlin himself. The McLaughlin group gets blamed for a lot of the problems in today's, today's television. The McLaughlin group certainly had enough, plenty of times of, uh, People shouting at each other, talking over each other, wrong, Eleanor, uh, <laughs> and things like that. And, but it, it, there are two interesting things that I think um, were intriguing about the McLaughlin group and that were not emulated by other uh, political chat shows and that I kind of feel like uh, were forgotten. One is that every one of the people on that uh, on that panel, Eleanor Clift, Pat Buchanan, Fred Barnes, Morton Kondracki, um, uh, they, they all – really knew their stuff. They were all serious writers, serious thinkers, well plugged in with good sources uh, of Freddie the Beatle Bonds. You know, um, they all, yes, they all had a viewpoint. You all knew exactly where they were coming from, but they were very well informed and well, uh, they were all pretty darn good at debating. Um, I don't think they're actually, despite the reputation, there really wasn't that much uh, name name calling and yelling and sneering at each other. The second thing, which, you know, most of the participants will tell you, in real life, most of them were friends, uh, or at the very least were social and then, you know, had Christmas parties together, and, and that there was this certain amiability. They were all j- pretty much happy warriors, uh, willing to argue the, the, the heck out of a particular topic uh, and be passionate about it and stand up for what they believed. But in the end, they, they didn't, you know, carry it over into contempt for each other or, or a seething, sneering, condescending tone. Um, they all had respected each other. And so I kind of feel like that was a... Um, a classic and good element to what televised political discussion and coverage could be. Uh, I miss John McLaughlin and I I miss the tone and the style that he created because uh, you talk about a guy who kind of made politics genuinely fun instead of the uh, forced march that it seems like these days. Um, I, I, it's a, it's a great influence and I think he will be uh, enormously missed in in the world of television and politics. Uh, A very good choice for a number of reasons. Uh, almost all of which you laid out. I just love the fact that it was original. There's so much copycat going on, and whether it's cable news or elsewhere, and cable news, of course, was in its infancy when the McLaughlin Group started, but uh, just a very unique approach to it. His personality kind of dominated. Uh, it became the caricature, like he said, on Saturday Night Live that was maybe larger than life, But uh, and it's it's just sad to see it gone, and given the fact that we've blatantly ripped off his idea for these uh, year-end awards, it's uh, appropriate that he is recognized there. At the same time, I thought there were two obvious choices when it came to conservatism this year, and I assumed you would pick one of them, and now I'm stuck trying to decide which one to do, so I will do a quick ode to one and spend a little more time on the other. Uh, Quickly to Phyllis Schlafly, uh, a very critical figure in the rise of the conservative movement, single-handedly spearheaded the effort to stop the ERA in the 1970s when she had no money and no internet to try and rally people. She just did it through grassroots work, working the phones, other conservative organizations. A lot of people think she's the reason, primarily the reason, that the Republican Party is a pro-life party uh, through the 1970s when you had folks like the Fords and others who were tilting more towards the pro-choice side. And she played a critical role in that. And she stayed very active right up until the very end. I know a lot of conservatives weren't too excited about the fact that she was so enthusiastic 
for Donald Trump, although she ended up being right uh, that he was uh, going to be the nominee. And she did not leave to see him get elected president. But uh, when you look at the total body of work uh, of Phyllis Schlafly, I think that needs to be recognized. But the biggest name of the year, I think, uh, in this category has to be Justice Antonin Scalia. We were all shocked and horrified to find out that he passed away in February while he was at that ranch in Texas. Uh, nearly 30 years on the U.S. Supreme Court, appointed by Reagan in 1986. And a guy like Justice Scalia confirmed unanimously, which tells you just how different uh, things are when it comes to judicial confirmation now. And not just conservative, but a brilliant legal mind who loved to spar, loved to spar with the lawyers. He would go to all sorts of different law schools, knowing that most of the students disagreed with him. And he would just engage in the debate and love to talk about the Constitution. He was passionate about it and why he was a textualist, as he liked to say it, and why this living Constitution thing to him was uh, I don't know what he say, judicial applesauce or argle bargle or one of those uh, great terms that he would use in, in his decision. He was just a crystal clear thinker. And just to take away a point you said about John McLaughlin, he was also extremely collegial. One of his best friends in life was Ruth Bader Ginsburg, which you just don't think about when you think about how differently their judicial philosophies are. But a titan on the court, even uh, liberal uh, law figures said that afterwards, that his impact on the court will be known for a long time and uh, just a, a great personality as well. And so, as you and I said at the time, it's kind of one of the f fundamental moments when we saw the, the real end of the Reagan era with the passing of Justice Scalia. And argue, arguably probably one of the most consequential news stories of the year was his passing and the battle that we saw over the, uh, uh, over the Supreme Court. So uh, excellent choice there, Greg. Um, everyone's going to be kind of a little upset with me for not picking that one. But I still like McLaughlin as a choice. <laughs> no, I think that was extraordinarily appropriate given our situation. But uh, uh, so as you said, there, this was a year. I mean, everybody knows 2016 was uh, the Grim Reaper year. And in politics, it was, it was no different. So uh, on to rising political star. Jim, who do you have for that? It's an interesting competition. I think some people might have uh, <coughs> said, well, look, you got to give it to Trump. Um, that he stands out as, as you know, somebody who everybody figured would not be a, a great influential figure in politics. And obviously he's the president elect. Um, but I went with this kind of a different one because uh, I felt like Trump had been around for a while and been kind of in the periphery of politics for a long time. Uh, I went with Todd Young, uh, who is going to be the next senator from Indiana. Uh, he beat the snot out of Evan Bayh, <laughs> a late entrant into the, uh, the Senate race out there. A lot of folks said, ah, well, Bayh's in. This is a Famous name in politics. This is an Indiana political dynasty. Uh, there's no way that uh, that Young was you know was going to be able to overcome this. And in fact, not only did he beat him, he, he really made it look easy. Um, you know, month by month, week by week, you could see Evan By slipping. Uh, it was very clear that Evan By had spent his time since he was last in the Senate enjoying being a high powerful lobbyist and uh, influence peddler. And had never really planned on going back to Indiana. And it showed little things like, you know, whether he had residence in the state and things like that. Uh, Todd Young's record in the House, he fought over regulation, which is not one of those uh, topics that's uh, sexy or gets a lot of attention. But I think it's really important. Um, and obviously, look, when you are the, the new senator from Indiana and the vice president is from Indiana. <laughs> and uh, obviously, we know uh, Mike Pence will be having a great deal of influence over uh, policy in this administration. I think Todd Young is going to be a guy who will become a mover and shaker uh, a little ahead of schedule uh, in light of who he is and what he's done, uh, the skills he brings to the table uh, and other factors. So keep your eye on Todd Young. We may be talking about him for, in, a, in, his, in an important capacity for many years to come. Yeah, good, good, good choice there, Todd Young, a member of the House for a number of years, but largely working quietly, as you mentioned, uh, beat back a Tea Party challenger and Marlon Stutzman in the primary, much easier than, than folks uh, had previously thought, and then beat Evan Bye by nearly 10 points in a race that was considered neck and neck. Pence being on the national ticket probably didn't hurt, but it was just not the year for uh, for lobbyists to go back home between uh, Bye and Russ, <laughs> Russ Feingold. Yeah, you know, if only someone had told... Um... Uh, the Democrats. That could be a flawed strategy. <laughs> oh, well. Oh, well. Maybe next time. Hopefully not. All right. Uh, Jim, one of the exciting things about a new administration, particularly if it's a Republican administration, is some figures that haven't been in Washington before, at least not in any major capacity, and people coming in who have done some important things and impressive things at the state level. And the Trump cabinet, as we record this, is still uh, coming together. Not all the positions have been filled out with the nominations. But one of them that has is administrator of the EPA. And the choice for that was Scott Pruitt. He is the attorney general of Oklahoma at the moment. 
And uh, the fact that you're getting reactions from people like former Obama communications director Dan Pfeiffer calling Scott Pruitt an existential threat to the planet and the Sierra Club saying it's like appointing an arsonist uh, to put out fires. Uh, that's a pretty good sign when the left is that uh, ex- uh, exercised about the whole thing. They call him a climate change denier or denialist because he isn't quite convinced that all these uh, projections from uh, climate change people, none of which that have actually come true, might not actually be all that clear. Uh, so he says there's uh, not settled science there. He's also been a thorn in the side of the EPA and suing them a number of times including things like the Waters of the United States rule, which the Obama EPA has now decided that a puddle in your backyard is a a navigable body of water if it's close enough to a different body of water, and therefore the government has jurisdiction over it. I think a lot of people are going to like the fact that Scott Pruitt sees a constitutional boundary for the EPA that the outgoing administration did not see, and I think we're going to see some common sense at the EPA that we haven't seen in a very long time. I like that choice, Craig. That is an excellent selection. Yeah, I mean, sometimes someone uh, ends up at a, you know, look, there, uh, when Christy Todd Whitman was in the uh, Environmental Protection Agency, um, I don't think there was enormous uh, uh, attention paid to it. Obviously, there was a lot, a lot of other major issues going on in the, uh, uh, in the early uh, days of the Bush administration. But I, I kind of have a feeling that this is a, a topic that deserves more attention, um, the uh, kind of the consequences of these uh, these regulations that are kind of put together in theory and that uh, those who have to live under them have uh, uh, haven't really thought through the the full ramifications of them I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of good uh, uh, good that can come from this and uh, I think the public could be well and could be well served by a more thorough and uh, detailed public debate about these regulations and the real cost of them yeah so we could see uh, Todd young and <laughs> And Scott Pruitt working together since they've got uh, a mutual interest in these regulations. The clean power rule uh, that's basically designed to kill the coal industry will be another one that will be closely watched. Uh, Jim, our third and final category in this installment is political figure fading into oblivion. I'll bet you, you can guess this one, Greg. I think we're in agreement on this one. All right. Way, finally, <laughs> way to go, Nevada. Way to go. <laughs> Not that you got rid of him, but in the sense that he is departing from the stage. Harry Reid. You know, a, a bad, bad man uh, who who is just I, look. It's not just that he's liberal. It's not just that he's partisan. We kind of figure that from a Senate Majority Leader. Out of all of his odious traits, uh, maybe odious is the right word because he used to complain about how the tourists smell uh, when they walk through the halls of the Capitol. Um, I, I, I'm going to go say his sheer dishonesty and lots of politicians lie. I think what obviously look in a long history of them, one that stands out is. His 2012 claim that Mitt Romney hadn't paid any taxes, always pretty outlandish, always uh, unsupported or, you know, he was unwilling to put forth any real evidence of that. Uh, After the election, you know, people went to him and said, well, how could you say that? Isn't it pretty obvious that uh, he's like, (laughs) well, it worked, didn't it? Um, I mean, he wasn't even going to give the 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 decency to feel regret about it or, or to say he shouldn't have said it. Uh, In his mind, if it works, if if it gets you the results you want, then lying is okay. Uh, this is what makes him a particularly toxic figure on Capitol Hill. Uh, I guess I kind of want to say it to uh, give credit to, to Mitt Romney, who upon Reed's departure, uh, Romney got to say, good riddance, which, as we all know, is Mormon for much more crude terms uh, <laughs> than most of us would say to uh, to Harry Reid. So goodbye, Harry Reid. Um, the Senate will be a better place without you, and American politics will be a better place with you uh, there. Oh, we should also point out, by the way, Greg, that he's very proudly said he's not going back to Nevada. Uh, he will continue to live in the Ritz-Carlton at Washington, in Washington, D.C. Well, hopefully it's on his own dime, although he's going to get a very nice pension, obviously. But I'm shocked that he's not going back to Searchlight. The whole grounding of his entire existence was, was Searchlight, but apparently he's not, it's not good enough for him to go back to. Fascinating. Yeah, Harry Reid is a guy who, like you said, it's, it's dishonesty, his nastiness. He got into uh, an issue during the, this last campaign. I can't even remember what the issue was now, but it was basically accusing – uh, the Trump campaign of uh, helping out a, fo- a foreign power, kind of like Tom Cotton was accused of when he issued the open letter uh, to to Iran I'm about the Logan Act. Yes, <laughs> the, the, yes. The, the, letter to foreign leaders. You're, you're you're making foreign policy that way. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> and Tom you Cotton. Know, I could do the same, Greg. And yeah, and Tom Cotton says uh, this is why uh, Harry Reid is one of the worst people in the Senate, and even Democrats are excited to see him go. Uh, that could mean that. Uh, you know, Chuck Schumer provides a different challenge. He certainly won't be easy to deal with. Uh, but Harry Reid uh, was nasty. I remember him uh, basically saying the war was lost in Iraq before the surge and it wasn't worth our time. Uh, he ruled the Senate with an iron fist. He hardly ever allowed a Republican amendment and yet still managed to accuse the, the Republicans of being the obstructionists and, uh, and holding things up in the Senate, which, of course, the press dutifully repeated. Uh, just... The way that he uh, shepherded Obamacare, everything behind closed doors, ramming through, ramming through, reconciliation. Uh, then, of course, changing the rules uh, on filibustering appointments, which is actually working out pretty well for Republicans here in the next few weeks. Uh, uh, should we give? Should we send a little bit of a thank you to say, uh, <laughs> you know, he technically did uh, uh, get rid of the filibuster, uh, thus eliminating the ability of Dem- Senate Democrats to stop the Trump nominees? Can no. You, say, right, you know, he did a little good, little bit of good. Uh, if his intent had actually been anywhere uh, remotely in that direction, <laughs> we might give him a little bit of credit, but no. Harry Reid deserves none. Uh, he's a despicable individual. I can think of nothing he contributed to Washington other than more rancor, more dishonesty, and eliciting more distrust from the American people. The fact that he was stuck in the minority for the last four years is fantastic. The fact that he will hopefully go away forever is joyous. I like that. Uh, excellent selection. It also says something that we both picked the same guy, doesn't it? <laughs> The only thing I'm going to miss about Harry Reid is we're not going to have the slogan anymore, but that's a trade I'm more than willing to make. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> the world is better off without him in the Senate and without us making that complaint every couple of weeks. <laughs> uh, Jim, more awards tomorrow. Talk to you then. See you, see you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us. And tune in again Wednesday for more year-end awards on the Three Martini Lunch.